Right. So, next bit, I've got lots of different uh, samples to show you. I'm going to try and go through the propagation chart, which is the previous page. <coughs> and, yeah. Yeah, let's do, try and keep, keep it to order. So, sowing seeds, various options, and <coughs> the seed mix. Now, if you just wanted a dozen seedlings, this two inch pot, that'd be fine. So it depends what scale you're working on. If your seedlings are larger seeds, and you just want a, a dozen or so, then a three inch pot would be great. Uh, but you could go up to four inch pot. And they could be used one after the other. So uh, Ruth's got to transplant the pot on the ochre, which is grown too big. So it's in a small pot, needs to go into the next size. I'll show you potting on in a bit, but yeah. These square pots, um, they fit nicely into these kind of trays, and I do recommend using a bit of newspaper, folded over at the edge, <coughs> and fit it into a tray to line the tray, so that the pot, pots you put in it have then got something to catch the water underneath, and again, that will reduce how quickly they dry out, hold more moisture for a bit longer, and just give you an edge in terms of keeping things moist for a bit longer. And also, bigger pot, uh, seed trays. These are half trays, and that's full tray. So these are just a couple of inches deep. And again, it depends how many seeds you, you need. I tend to be sowing lots of a small amount, of, yeah, a large range of just a few seeds at a time. So these are my favourite size. So I can get between 50 and 100 little seedlings going on in there. And some things, yeah, would prefer, larger seeds would prefer their own pot. Things like uh, courgettes and the squash. You'd plant one or maybe two seeds in each of these pots. And within a month, they'll need planting out or potting on. Uh, other things like brassicas and leeks and onions, you can start 50 or 100 off in here, and then maybe pot cabbages on into their own pot, or prick out uh, little leeks and onions uh, into a larger container after about a month. But yeah, uh, think of it not just as you plant them in a seed tray or a pot, and then you plant them out a month later. You might have to pot them on or prick them out before they go out finally. And yeah, having plants that are well established before they're planted out is absolutely crucial. If you try and plant them out too soon, then they're very vulnerable, especially things like onions. They can have a, a difficult time. So let's do seed tray first. You might have to mirror over to, to get this. I'll try and do it this way around. But yeah. I'd fill up my seed tray to within about a centimetre of the top. If I know the seedlings are going to grow really vigorously, then I might put a bit more mixture on. But I don't want to bring it up to the same level as the edge, because then water might pour off the sides. So a little bit lower than the edge. And then what have we got here? Various seeds. Chamomile seeds. That'll do for a small tray. So chamomile seeds. Have you sown those seeds yet, Serena? I have, yes. Coming up? I don't know. Oh, no, I've only put them in this weekend. Right. That's yeah. wild chamomile. And that's got some petals in it, but a large proportion of that is mm -hmm. seeds. And, uh, uh, yeah, when you buy seed packets, uh, you do find often there's not quite enough seed, or they're very stingy about how many seeds you've got. So, especially when we're sowing rows and yeah, remembering that some crops we want to sow direct. We don't want to sow in pots first. All the root crops, if we transplant them, every time we transplant them, we could damage the root, and that's the bit that's going to give us the vegetable. So with all the root crops, beetroots, carrots, parsnips, we want to prepare a seed bed and put our time and energy into preparing the soil. Uh, you could start <coughs> some off early on, but especially with carrots and parsnips, uh, they want to grow deep down and it's not really a good method to sow in containers first. <coughs> but the point I'm trying to make is, I've got that much seed, and I want to distribute it equally over the container that I'm going to use. 
So what I'm trying to do is sow very thinly to begin with, over the whole area, save some of the seed, and come back and put a little bit more in, again, filling in the gaps so I get as good a distribution over that area as possible. Now, the caution or the point I'm making is don't sow all your seeds on one end and then you've run out of seeds and you haven't got anything up the other <coughs> end. And that's just in a seed tray. But if we think about that, when we're sowing drills, like we saw a picture of last week, if you've prepared a lovely bed and you've bought some seeds <coughs> and then you sow too thickly up your drill and you get halfway up the drill and you run out of seeds, then you've got to rush off to the garden centre or order some more seeds before you can complete your row. Uh, so the recommendation, either in seed trays or sowing a drill a row, is to make sure you get from end to end, sowing really thinly first, and then if you've got some seed left, come back and sow some more. And actually, when we're sowing rows of crops, like the root crops, uh, we can sow quite densely if we've got enough seed, and thin later on. Once the little seedlings are up, we pull up lots of them and get rid of them, and just leave roughly the right number to grow on to maturity. But it's good practice to actually get lots of little seedlings going, more than enough, rather than have a gap in the row or have to transplant some from one part of the row to the next. And also, if we're sowing on nice flat rows, on raised beds, which are terraced and the soil is flat on them, then when we water, the soil goes down equally along the row. If you sow on a slope and you've got your drill running up and down the slope, all the water collects at one end and it drags all the seed down to one end. You get hundreds of seedlings at one end and none at the rest. That's a, yeah, lessons from experience there. <laughs> so, these seeds are so small, I reckon uh, they probably germinate just on the surface with small seeds. Uh, I like to put just one sheet of newspaper if we're going to get hot weather over the top. Uh, and that's not in contact with the seeds, but that will keep them shaded so they won't dry out and then they'll have enough time to germinate. The larger the seeds, the more seed mix we put on top of them. So with these very fine seeds, I barely cover them with seed mixture. Uh, and just tamping it down so it's equally lying all over the tray and that will keep them in place. But yeah, we don't want to bury them too deep. If I put too much mixture, the little seed leaves won't be able to push up through the mixture. But the general rule is there is uh, you recommend it to bury the seeds twice as deep as the longest part of the seed. So I've got some marigold seed here, and they're odd shapes. Some of them are small, some of them are larger. But yeah, if we take that one as an example, that marigold seed when it gets its first leaves on, they'll be up to an inch long. So actually it could push through an inch of soil on top of it and it would still be fine. But yeah, uh, the general rule is twice as deep, twice as much on top as the seed is at its longest point. So that's about three or four mil, maybe five mil. So we can put a centimetre on top of them and they'd still come through fine. Uh, so the more, the bigger the seed, the deeper on top you'd bury them. And then just in a small part just demonstrate if we're sowing things like uh, squashes or sweet corn with larger seeds basically, we'd fill up the pot again to just below the lip and then actually what have we got here? Cucumbers uh, not quite big enough be better with squash but you see they're long and the way I want to plant those is on their side. Oop. So if I hold that between my fingers like that and place it in sideways and actually uh, sharp end down into the soil. Can you see that? Should I have a magnifying glass for this bit? <laughs> so it's on its side and the sharp edge is going down. And I'll push that in up to an inch because that will come up through an inch of soil and put soil on top of that. Now, that's imagining when the seedling opens, uh, the root comes out first, and that goes down, and that anchors the seedling. And then, if they're planted like that on their side, uh, as they leave, the, the seed leaves are levered up, 
they cut through the soil. If they're flat on the soil like that, mm. they'd have to push more soil up. And it would only be a minor thing, but that would reduce mm. the number that would germinate successfully. So it's putting them in like that. And let's have a look over here. So here's some I've done before. This is peas germinating. And you can see some of those, is what we think of as the seed, is actually at the soil level. But it's released the root to go down and the shoot to go up already. So that's an example. They're actually germinating on the soil surface. And in early spring, when there's not too much sun, that, that does happen quite a bit. Just seeds on the surface of the soil, they'll get away and germinate okay. As these grow up, we'll be earthing them up by hoeing uh, to support them. So that bit is going to get covered later on, but once it's developed a bit, bit more. But its roots are developed, haven't they? And <laughs> look at that, it's amazing. Yeah, roots coming out the bottom already. They've only been germinated for about a week. Would you prick those out or would you plant it as a hole like that? Peas, they'll grow happily in a clump as long as I put them in. The, they, these are bound, to, uh, planned to go in a bigger bucket. Right. And if they get moist, those will actually grow okay. That's a purple fruit. So when you're sowing seeds, at what point do you water after you've got them in? Um, yeah. Some recommendations say you should water your seed row or your seed tray before you sow. That's what I've come across. And I, I don't do that, and I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, especially if you... Kind of, yeah, it would be okay to water the seed mix in the tray yeah. and then sow on top of that. But, yeah, if you water with a rose, so it's fine, gentle kind of rain on top of that, it's going to spread out. The only danger is if you put too much water in at once. And that's a general underlying rule that uh, you wet the surface first, just very light, not, not soaking it. And then once the water is spread on the surface, the next bit of water you put on will sink down in the same place and it will spread equally over the surface. This is true of all, all stages of watering. If you put too much in, on in one go, then it will soak through in one place and drip out, and other bits will be pretty much dry still. So whenever you're watering, think about that. A little bit of water first, just to wet the soil, and then the next bit of water you put on a few seconds or minutes later, that grips onto the moistened soil, and it spreads uniformly rather than too much in one place. Good question. All right. And where am I up to now? So. Yeah, if I'm doing a bigger batch, uh, want more more seedlings, then I'll, I'll use bigger pot or the bigger tray. And I'm actually going to mix that in with that a bit and demonstrate that in a bit. So that was seed. We've done seed compost and that's grit. Let's do that next. -ish. Um, yeah, one more here. I'm not quite exactly following your list. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but yeah, if I want, what I've got here is little leeks. And these could have been from seed, but actually they're from the, f the flower head that formed on the leek mm -hmm. last year. And instead of having flowers or after having flowers, it also had little seedlings. And that's a, a quality of leeks. They'll form side bulbs after they've gone to flower, and you can actually plant them out and they'll grow on. Or you can save the seed. And the third way is, if you leave the, f the flower head a bit longer, some of them will actually form little leek plants on the top where the flowers. <laughs> so hopefully these have started to root down to the bottom. But there's too many to grow on in this pot for much longer. They start to crowd each other out. So I'm going to have to separate these up. And I'm trying to demonstrate pricking out, but first, uh, when you've got a load of seedlings like this, I'll show you again in a minute, but um, to try and separate these off, what we've got to think of is we're trying to separate them from ground level all the way down, because that's the way the roots are going to be grown. Yeah? So there's lots of roots in there, and generally they're all going downwards. So if I want to split a clump like this, I'll start at ground level and divide them from the top down and pull away to separate the two bunches and then I'll separate off a smaller number so I've now got individual seedlings that I can pull one off at a time yeah? and 
just a small demonstration of this, which is pricking out. Uh, I'm going to mostly fill a tray, like that, and try and do this so you can see what's going on. And yeah, in this case, I'm going to create a little furrow at one end of the seed tray. You'll have to peer over to get this. And then arrange individual seedlings separately with a little bit of soil around each one. And so along that row, just moving a bit of soil up around each one. We'll get about four or five in a row there. So each root system is now separate, yeah? And as I work my way across the tray, I'll create another little furrow for another row. And then when they're all finished, and that's full of maybe 20 or 30 little seedlings, if I press the soil down, then I'll bring them up to vertical and they'll stand right. And then I'll, again, moisten them and then water them properly. Uh, and that will grow them on for another month or two and then they'll be big enough to plant out. Some of these leeks are nearly strong enough to hold themselves up, and therefore that one might just survive if it's planted out in a bed straight away. But if I grow it on for another month, it'll get thicker and more leaves, and have more stem, and then when I plant it out, it'll be more likely to be successful. But that's pricking out, so that's with lots of seedlings, and rather than using an individual pot for each one, I'm using a tray and putting a larger number of seedlings in each tray. Just tidy up this lot. So would you be keeping this, these seeds and seedlings in a polytunnel or cold frame? Depends on the weather. Uh, it's nearly warm enough by day to put some of these things out and start to harden them off. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's still really cold at night. Mm. So uh, it's a bit early to start putting them out already. Yeah, it's trying to think again what's coming next in terms of. Uh, I think we're going to get it's, it's likely to be a bit colder because it's been really warm. So I want a bit more cold before I'm happy to plant things out like that. Not quite yet. And let's put that back in there. So that's seeds and pricking out. And let's have a look at some more things. Here I've got two tomatoes. So that one was raised in January under lights with heat. This one was raised in February last month, so that's about four weeks old. That's about eight weeks old. They both had enough light to get them germinating, and then they've been out in the sun for the last few days since the days have got longer, and therefore there's enough sun to keep these alive. Again, it's a space question, because I started off with 40 varieties of tomatoes, and not this many seedlings, about a dozen seedlings in small pots. For about up to a month, they were okay as small seedlings. These have only just been potted on. Those have been potted on for six weeks now, so they've had a, bit of a chance to grow on a lot more. If I wanted to grow tomatoes indoors, that is now big enough that I could plant, uh, transplant it into a big pot and as long as it's going to be frost-free, pr frost that would actually grow on uh, fine now. And just to illustrate, potting on, each time we pot on, we plant it deeper uh, than the previous pot. So that's an inch deeper. And with tomatoes especially, uh, you get extra roots that will form from the buried stem. So we'll get a bigger rooting system uh, if that's planted deeper in the next pot and that might carry on through its life and we plant, plant even deeper. Yeah. The roots are only just getting to the edge of this pot, so I could actually leave this one for another week or two, depending on how warm it is. Uh, so yeah, eventually that stem might be buried that, that deep, right up to the first true leaves. But for the first potting on, just up to the seed leaves, which will give up the ghost quite early, but to give extra root system. And that's true of all plants to some degree. Cabbages will do that as well a bit, but especially with the tomatoes, bigger root system from burying them deeper and each time we plant, plant out or pot on uh, if there's more soil on top of where the roots are that's protecting it from the heat and the sun and the roots won't dry out if they're planted out a little bit deeper than they were previously. 
Sorry, what sort of pot are you looking at indoors? What sort of size for a mature tomato plant? Bucket. A couple of people under. Bucket size. Yeah. So that's a 12 inch tough, at least 12 inch deep. Yeah. So it's about five inch pot. And then because of what's happening, we'll have to put a couple of people in the platform because of So that's the extra concentrates the Putin Horn, Blood Fish and Bone, Chicken Minion. And I'm actually going to use this one to demonstrate potting up. So uh, we'll keep it in a pot for another month or so, in which case I want to uh, transfer this into a larger pot. And yeah, uh, so I'm going to keep the root system intact in the same pattern as it is now. There's roots on the outside which are wanting more space. So I want to centre this plant in the middle of the new pot, slightly lower down than it was before. And again, having done this thousands and thousands of times, <coughs> the best practice is, see what I've done, I've put about half the soil I need on one side of the pot, uh, and it's horizontal, and then I'm going to slip the plant in to the, roughly the middle point, hold it in place while I put a bit more mixture down the other side, and what I'm trying to do is make sure that there's soil all around the root system, between the roots and the outer edge of this pot. As I fill it up, I can write it, and then on a firm surface, press down so there's a good bond between the existing roots and the new soil. And you can see I've planted it just about an inch deeper, so the seed leaves are now at soil level. So that will now be happy for another month and grow up about this big before it needs putting in a big bucket. I uh, won't do the same with that because that's only just been potted on so it hasn't formed a root system yet. But I'm going to offer these two plants. Uh, this one is a yellow butterfly which is a small kind of uh, pear shaped golden cherry type tomato and that can have a thousand tomatoes on it. Anybody want to grow a thousand tomatoes? <laughs> so that's yellow butterfly. And yeah, with these plants, write the name down. And yeah, especially when I do the herbs, I'll say this again, but I'm trying to get you to remember as many of the herbs as possible. So I haven't given you labels. So I'm forcing you to remember. It's very challenging, isn't it? And this one, uh, you'll have to be kind of confident enough that you can grow it on. But yeah, this one, you can see it's got furry leaves. This one is subarctic plenty, which they chose different varieties of tomatoes. This one is the most cold tolerant, so if you're on a cold site, this would still grow. And part of the action is these furry leaves look silvery as it grows, absolutely gorgeous looking plant, but the fur actually protects the leaves very slightly and just keeps the chill off it. Who's going to go for that? Oh, that really really Could that one go in the outside? In the garden? More likely, yeah. again, a little bit, a couple of weeks into the future. Yeah, and depending on, if in the city centre, you might get away with it now. But two to four weeks' time, depending on how far out you are, how cold it is. You need to write the name down. It's cold where I live. So, what was the name of it? Subarctic Plenty. Okay. Mm. I had two tomato plants that <coughs> size last year. Yeah. And I, and I put, I, I'm wondering what I did, but I put them in quite big um, pots. Yeah. Maybe too early, I'm thinking. Yeah. I did keep them in um, side. Yeah. But they went really, really leggy. Ah, yeah, yeah. So is that my soil, or is that because I potted them into a too big a pot too quickly? Too much heat and not enough light. Uh, and yeah. now the day's getting longer, that's firming up growth and kind of uh, yeah. balancing the growth. But that's the same as when we're chitting potatoes, and if they're kept in the dark and the warm, you get a really long shoot. Yeah. Uh, whereas if they're in the light, you get a shorter shoot, just one, mm. one or two inches long. Mm. Pushing them on a bit too early. Yeah. A bit and too should much. I put them out then on my stays? Yeah, that would help, yeah. yeah. That would help. So they, yeah. yeah. To consolidate their growth. Because yeah. it sounds like they were rushing yeah, away. Yeah, they went really. <laughs> but got, they were too thin. If they've got either heat yeah. from below or lots of fertiliser in the mixture, that would yeah. kind of trigger growth. But if there's not enough day length and sun to kind of firm that up, then you end up with a stringy. So could you try like replanting them with the stem to hold it up and then it would make more roots? So yeah, yeah. Might be mm, yeah, they sort of went really quick and then I think yeah. I didn't yeah, do anything else. Earthing up to give more roots. <laughs> and then, yeah, here's some little summer cabbages. This is a Portuguese type cabbage. 
These are actually a little bit small to, to pot on already, but uh, I'll use them as a demonstration. Usually I'd wait maybe another week or two until the proper leaves have started to emerge. So these aren't competing with each other at the moment, but in a couple of weeks they will be. And again, it's a similar version to the leaklets. It's just see what we've got. And again, each plant is going down vertically. So if we work from the edge, break up the soil, and just push the sides of the soil, and that'll start to separate the roots off. And again, if we get a bunch of them off first, and then we can subdivide that bunch. And yeah, when we're holding seedlings, the crucial thing is we don't want to squeeze or, or snap the stem because that's the bit that's joining the, the shoot and the root. So actually holding the first leaf, the seed leaf, and I've got a nice little root system there. And in this case, because I'm, I've got a moist mix around these seedlings, you can see the pattern of the roots is holding the soil together. And that's good, rather than be bare-rooted. And now, again, if I get my pot on the side, and... I'm trying to get the bottom of the root down to the bottom of the pot and the main part of the root system right in the middle of the pot and then as I fill up bring it up to vertical and I've got a nice centred plant especially with the roots in the middle and with soil underneath them so the roots can grow out in all directions up, down and around and then pressing these in I'll push that down, now I've got not enough soil in the pot, I could put a bit more in there and again slightly against some people's advice, I'm pressing it quite hard yeah? and that's so that the roots and the soil are joined together below ground but also it's just in case oh, just in case I drop them <laughs> yes. and it's still per perfectly fine mm -hmm. so I don't have to clear up this. so yeah, if you're working with a heavy clay soil, and it's got heavy clay in it. Um, yeah, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't need to press down as far, but by pushing down quite hard, so it doesn't then fall over if I drop it, uh, that's actually going to be creating a good bond between the roots and the new soil. That's fine. And actually, yeah, I can water that with a rose. But if I'm watering with a can, as long as I don't water it at the plant itself, just water it to the side of it, and that's the same as I was showing you in the pictures last week with the soil sculpture. We're trying to water the root system, not the plant. I'll stop there. Anybody want uh, a summer cabbage plant? Yeah. That, got to watch it, make sure it doesn't fall over because it, it's not rooted yet in the pot. It's just kind of suspended in there for a week, a day, a day or two. That's Portuguese cabbage. Uh, so that's a little bit about seedlings and potting on and yeah this advice about doing it on its side is to centre the root in the middle of the pot most people's instinct and yeah if you're working with tiny little plants maybe these leeks we could do it with one of those that's the root system it's not a very big root system and in that case I'm actually it's legitimate to just push a hole down into the mixture and then dribble the leak down, make sure the roots are going right down to the bottom of the pot if possible, and move the soil around that, and that would actually be okay. Uh, yeah, so with tiny little seedlings that haven't got much of a root system, you can just push a hole in the top. But with anything that's established enough, what I showed you on its side, <laughs> positioning the root system right in the middle of the pot is the preferable answer. Um, do you sterilise your pots, Richard? No, no. 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 Uh, so if you, don't, if you get the room from elsewhere or they've been left lying around for ages or mm. they're used by different crops or different plants. I just leave them out in the rain, in the yeah. sun, yeah. and don't really have any problem. Yeah. But yeah, soil sterilisation, if you were on a site for uh, decades and growing one variety of thing like, uh, yeah, I know a guy who used to have a little nursery on the edge of uh, Walkley and it was chrysanthemums every year, over and over again, on all the soil, and then diseases are going to build up, because you're just monocropping, and the downside to soil sterilisation is, as we've talked about with antibiotics and probiotics, that as soon as you get rid of all the helpful microbes that are in the soil, that might digest your pests and diseases, if you do get 
problem, then it can ravage through your mixture and actually be worse. Um, but yeah, damping off is the other one. And somebody mentioned that to me this week. Uh, you sow your seeds, or you pot on your seedlings, and you water maybe a bit much, maybe it's a bit damp and a bit cool, and then you get this green kind of mothy mould growing on the top of your seed mix. But uh, with leaf mould, I don't really get that problem. But that, that again can uh, kind of locks the surface of the soil together, and the soil can't breathe, uh, and it is an algae or something that then uh, yeah, s kills your seedlings, eats your seedlings again. Damping off another problem. Uh, so that was that bit. I'll just do a, a, a quick selection of propagations. And yeah, partly that's thinking on the sheet about what we've talked about with if we had a, a garlic bulb, you break it up individual cloves, each individual clove you plant, and that becomes a bulb the next year. So think about that. The bulb bills. That's illustrated, uh, sometimes happens on garlic, you get little new plants on the top of your garlic and you can plant those. Uh, onion sets, now if you're planting onion sets they're <coughs> easy because they've done some of the growing already so you get a little set about that big. Uh, but the process of making an onion set is they grow onion plants and then before they get too big they check the growth either with hot water or by chemical intervention and that means it stops halfway through its first year. But especially larger onion sets, when you replant them, they think they're in their second year. And also, if onion sets get dried out, and I mentioned we had a drought last week, it hasn't rained, we've still got a drought, we're in the third week of a drought, uh, and that means onion sets really need watering, because if they dry out, they'll think it's their second year, because they're biennials, and they'll go to flower in the first year, instead of forming a bulb. So onion sets are very easy to plant, but you won't get as much back, and also they won't store for as long, so you use them up quicker than your ones from seed. Uh, but yeah, if you can get hold of organically grown onion sets, they are better than just the standard, <coughs> standard issue, but cost a little bit more, you have to think ahead to get them. And then roots and offsets and tubers. Tubers, we've seen a potato with a little chit on it. Um, let's go into these materials here. So. I've brought some bits of comfrey for you. They're all about this big. So that might be... Just take a, a smaller piece if you've only got enough space to grow it in a pot. So this in itself is illustrating... You can see several shoots at the surface and the root joining it together. So what happened is last year, one shoot was growing here and that then the second year had extra shoots, side shoots, around it. That happens with things like rhubarb. Any, root, any perennial that keeps its root from year to year will have that to some degree. <coughs> if I want to propagate, the crucial underpinning rule is I want to get a shoot with a root attached. A shoot and a root makes a new plant. So in this case, I can cut down. I'm trying to get that shoot established. It comes off quite nicely uh, with a bit of root attached. So that's a new plant. So if I want one new plant, that's that. And then I've just noticed, can you see that little bit there? Mm. That looks like another shoot to me. So it's a much smaller scale. But if I cut down, oh, it's a microscopic scale. But I've now got a shoot, and it has still got a bit of root attached. And some of that is the, uh, the perennial root, some of that's a fibrous root. So believe it or not, that's a new comfrey plant, a micro comfrey plant. But it will grow as big as the other ones eventually. But yeah, um, I can illustrate that. Oh, I'll just show you other ways of propagating comfrey, and that is just chopping up the root into sections. So each section will have dormant buds, and if I can plant it the right way up at the top, with the top upwards, it'll know where it's going. But yeah, <coughs> in the process, it'll callus over the cuts, they'll heal in a couple of days, and then the life that's left, the energy left in that root, uh, dormant buds will swell up and actually initiate a new shoot. So each little bit of the comfrey will give a new plant. Not everything is quite that <coughs> generous in terms of getting more plants, but comfrey would, and also horseradish. This is horseradish. 
Would you leave the top just out in the light, or do you put the top under? It could be if it's just buried. That would that would probably form a, a shoot under the ground, just under the ground. Anybody want a smell of horseradish <laughs> from the cut end? So, in the case of horseradish, I've been digging it out from my site for the last ten years, and it keeps on coming back. So I dig it down about eighteen inches down. I leave a bit of root in the ground. And then within a year, this gets to the surface, and can't quite see it now, but these teeth, uh, saw-shaped first leaves. And again, if I chopped it, each one of those little sections, if you put that in a pot, bury it, put the soil on top of it, that will do the same as the comfrey and come alive from the root cutting. And I've got one major shoot here, but like <coughs> with the comfrey, I think I've got extra little shoots around the edge of the, the, the main shoot crown here. Yeah? So to get a cutting from that, if I cut down just behind that little shoot and extract it, so I've now got a shoot with a bit of root attached, and if I'm careful about that, that will make a new plant as well. So that's a couple of ways of getting root cuttings going. And then <coughs> let me show you our I've got several things which will do this, which is just basically taking a cutting. I'll just show you one more root before we go on to that. And yeah, this looks like strawberry, but it's actually potentilla. And this would have just had one shoot with one set of leaves on last year, but now that shoot is subdivided and it's throwing up <coughs> several new shoots. Uh, in this case, I want to cut down behind that shoot and sliver off a little bit of the main root. So that's the main root. That's going to keep this cutting alive, root cutting. Uh, maybe I'd take off the larger leaves to reduce the transpiration, to reduce the stress on the young plant, but just leave the shoot with its growing point and the new leaves there. Put that in a pot. It's got enough root to keep it alive. Uh, once the shoot starts growing, it'll form more fibrous roots, and I've got a new potentilla plant. And spring's the right time to do that. Isn't it? Excellent time. Anybody want <coughs> a potentilla plant? Red, red flowers. Uh, got them. Oh, potentilla. Yeah, they are very nice. Write the name down. <coughs> now, let's have a look. <coughs> yeah, rosemary's my favourite for doing cuttings of at this time of year. <coughs> and you can see, with this rosemary, I've snapped off that part of the branch last year and eaten it. And then all the energy has gone into the side shoots, which has made them longer. They're just about starting to flower. That's the flower buds on them. And actually, uh, with cuttings, when we're taking cuttings, we take flowers off, because that's going to uh, draw energy out of the plant. But what I'm looking for is a shoot four to six inches long. And I want to take that from the, the, old, the main plant with what's called a heel. The heel is where the new shoot is attached to the older wood. And if I pull it downwards and away, a bit like that potentilla, instead of root, I've got a bit of the old stem. But that will help to keep the plant alive until it's established. And general principle for making cuttings, uh, this is the bit we want to keep. If it's going to flower, we might nip out the top to stop it carrying on and going to flower. And then because this is going to go into a pot with no roots for a month or so, uh, the wood will keep it alive. But if I leave all the leaves on, they're going to transpire. It'll lose too much moisture and it's less likely to strike, make new roots. So in this case, I'm going to strip off all the lower leaves. Each leaf that I've just pulled off has created a wound where it was joined to the main stem. <coughs> they callus over, repair themselves, and then if they find that they're below ground, it's moist and dark, they'll start to form roots from the point where the leaves have joined on. So where it was a leaf, it changes into a root. Mm -hmm. And yeah, these are pretty successful, especially at this time of year. And taking cuttings at this time, we're starting in the relatively cool, relatively shorter days. So that's not going to get too much stress from a, a hot sunny day. But in a month's time, when the little roots are starting to form in the cuttings compost, it'll get warmer. And so 
that will actually help cuttings to form, the, the cut root system to form. And you can actually get what's called bottom heat, so you get a heating mat, and especially if you're doing cuttings in the winter, a little bit of heat from below will do the same job. But at this time of year, it's just the right time to take a cutting now, and then as, it, as days get longer, as the weather gets warmer, uh, that will actually grow on successfully. I'll just do a couple more just to illustrate. Okay. Oh yeah, I have a bit of rose now. <laughs> so that's nipping the top off, stripping the lower leaves. I've been quite brutal, but I've got four or five growing points there left on. And then let's just get a bit of the gritty mix. So this is striking cuttings into gritty mix. Start off with it right up to the top, because that's going to get pushed down, compressed once the cuttings are in. Imagine about a dozen to 20 cuttings. These are woody enough that I can push them right down to where the first leaves are. Maybe not that one. I think it's going to go in. Push them around the gritty bits until they're firm enough in. And then again, pressing down so they don't wobble. If they wobble, then they're going to rip away and the little roots might get damaged. And to successfully get cuttings of most things, it's good to put a plastic bag over the top of them, and that's creating uh, a little greenhouse effect. It's increasing the humidity in that bag, <coughs> so that instead of transpiring and the moisture gets lost into the atmosphere, the moisture stays within here, stays more humid, and again, that's good for the cuttings when they're first striking, but in a month's time, if that gets hot, if it, it could get too hot and too humid in there. At that stage, I'll just prick a little hole and look in, make sure they're still alive. If I leave it in on too long, that will actually be counterproductive and it'll bake them, and, uh, well, boil them in, boil in the bag. And the other thing with cuttings is also I want to water them from below. So they've got a little greenhouse, humid environment on top and a saucer underneath and then I'll just water into the saucer so I don't have to take the bag off each time. And longer term... If they find that the water is down at the bottom of the pot in the saucer, that's going to encourage the root system to grow out and down. If I watered from them, them from above every day all the time, the root systems maybe wouldn't bother or wouldn't grow out as quickly in search of water. So the roots in the cuttings, uh, yeah, they're looking for moisture. You wouldn't keep that moist all the time, watering every other day just enough to keep it moist but uh, not drowning them, not drowning them when you... Uh, so I can do the same thing. This is box. Box is a woody perennial. And, again, if I just find a long enough side shoot and rip down, so I've got a heel of old wood on there, and nip out the top so it doesn't get a chance to flower. This is actually flowering at this moment. That's the flowers of box. And then, again, stripping off all the lower leaves and almost damaging those. So I've just got half a dozen shoots at the top. You can see the little leaflets that are going to make the new plant. And also, yeah, sometimes we do this with uh, uh, soft fruit, with gooseberries. We can leave a leg on a gooseberry so it grows up a bit first and then its side branches because the fruit pulls the side branches down. Whereas if I'm planting blackcurrant... Uh, I want shoots from ground level, so I'd bury it deeper. So if I bury it like that, it'll still get roots on the lower down, and it'll have a little stem, like a little trunk. Or if I, it's a different type of plant, might want planting closer to the soil. I've actually got black currant here, which is flowering, and it's too late really to take black currant cuttings, but they can be done the same way. Heel down the bottom, and stripping off all the lower lower leaves this soft growth at the top, I'm just going to nip off the flowers and leave three or four shoots with leaves on. <coughs> but by taking away the flowers, that would otherwise be energy that this plant won't have to give. It wouldn't be able to form any fruits. Uh, needs a root system first. But yeah, black currants are very deeper. I get shoots coming up from low down to create a stooled plant. And here's a bit of hyssop that's come through the winter. This has grown out to that extent already. And same thing, it's a, a finer plant, but if I carefully take it off the old plant with a bit of the wood, a heel, 
The rest of it's green, it's all new wood, but that also will strike as a cutting, maybe nip off the top, so the side shoots are what grows. And I've not got much work. I can illustrate, these are all perennials, and you can do those in the winter. Rosemary and box, there's a box, what I've done pre previously. Anybody want a box plant? Start your own box hedge. There you go, Richard. And if you do make a hedge, you're supposed to take cuttings from the same plant, and then they're all genetically uniform, so they grow at the same rate. Uh, that's in the future. And one more there, myrtle. This myrtle, uh, first it grows upwards, and then the weight of the leaves and the fruit brought it down to the horizontal. Again, I've nipped it off at the end, and the side shoots have now grown up. So each one of these side shoots will be suitable for making a cutting from. A bit small, but they'd be fine. Lovely plant. Robin scrunch that one. Myrtle. It used to be really common. Mm. It's, it's, not, it's okay. not quite winter hardy yet. Yeah. Mm. It'd be similar to bay, bay mm. tree. Gorgeous smell. That has little fruits on, which are like yeah, medicinal lozenges later on. But it was so cold this winter, that cold snap has killed a few of my, my myrtles. So <coughs> what I'm showing you here with the perennials the woody plants like box and rosemary, that's winter, preferably, cuttings. So you do them October, November, mm. and they just sit there through the winter, and then as the spring warms up, they'll start to callus, take a longer time to, to mm. form their roots. Whereas in summer, we can do herbaceous uh, or softwood cuttings. So this is, uh, I'd call it a, a geranium, but it could also be called a pelagonium. And yeah, as a houseplant, it, it's useful, it's a hormonal regulator. So whether you're up or down on your hormones, it's supposed to help either way. And this growth is what grew last year. It's getting a bit long and floppy. But you can see from the base, I've got lots of new shoots that are coming in from right ground level. And that's typical of biennial or perennial. Uh, it'll keep some of last year's growth, but the new growth will come from the base. So repeating what I've just done with the other plants, if I can find where those new shoots are joined onto the main stem and rip them down and take a cutting with a heel, strip off the lower leaves and put that in the cuttings mix, I've got a new plant of a geranium. And you can actually do that just in water. With this particular <coughs> plant, it doesn't need air and moisture to create a cutting. So you can just stick that in a jam jar, a month or two, it'll get new roots, and then you can pot it on, and it's a new plant. Anybody want a little geranium? Here we go. Richard, my granddad used to use something called hormone rooting compound or something. What's that? I guess it's not organic. Hormone rooting powder yeah. is a, a combination, it's a fungicide uh, to stop these cuttings get, getting uh, infected with fungus before they strike and get, get roots. I have tried it, I have used it a little bit, but it's not, not really relevant. And like with pruning, I recommend if you get a little bit of salt from, from your brow, sweat, mm. that's, salt will, will be a fungicide, mm. and so you could actually just touch, touch the base of these and that will stop fungus getting in. Yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, there's a suggestion that you've got growth hormones or hormones in your sweat, yeah. Yeah. which will actually help with... Uh, Re rooting again. So that's a, a, a free, cheap alternative. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend using hormone rooting powder. Maybe if you're doing things out of season or in heat at the wrong time of year or more advanced uh, type of plants, you might there might be uses for it justified, but it's uh, yeah, just a, fun a fungicide basically. Yeah, but not found no need for it. And then I've just got a few more here. Let's just illustrate. This big one is Lovage. It smells like celery, and it's peaking at this time of year. And in this case, it's a big ball of root, and that's the old shoot from last year. And again, if I find where those shoots are coming out of the ground and cut them off, hopefully this will have a bit of root attached still. Yeah. So that's shoot with a bit of root. That's a new lovage plant. Anybody want lovage? There you go, Mike. Thank you. 
So Try not to drop the mud uh, on the floor. So it's lovage. What is lovage? Is it got sweet rub if we have it? Is it a rub it and smell it. Okay. And it's a strong celery flavour. A couple more smaller ones. I won't illustrate this. Skull cap. That's typical of mint family. And so the new shoots are just coming up for this year. I'll just show you what's going on below ground. So it's rooted down to the bottom of the pot and then it's come back up and the shoots have come to the surface. And there's probably actually any bit of that root you could break off and that would make a new plant. And then lawn chamomile, that's a perennial if you, if you cut the flowers off. And that divides a bit like um, a, a strawberry plant. So it was one shoot last year and this year it's a half dozen shoots and I can separate them off and get lots of individual plants off that. And then easiest one of all, the yeah. spider plant phytolacca. <laughs> this is good indoors, again, because it um, uh, counteracts your positive ions. Is that what it does? Or it sweetens the air, anyway. And so this is a runner. There's the, the umbilical cord joining it to the mother plant. And really, any time from now on, these can just be pulled off. And you can just see and feel at the base, they're starting to form a root. So if you bury that, that will form a new spider plant. Anybody want a spider plant? Uh, I think that's enough of propagation and cuttings. Yeah. There's other ones at the bottom of here. Uh, they really go down in size. So certain plants, like begonias, you can get a leaf and you cut it into little bits and if you put it at the right level in the soil, you get a new plant growing off a bit of leaf. And other ones, like bud, uh, the grapes have just grown a bit too much now. They started to form their shoots for this year. But if you get them before the buds burst, again, with a sliver of old wood just behind the bud, and you put it in the soil just at the right level, not too deep, as it comes alive, the old wood keeps it alive and forms a bit of root, and the shoot comes alive, and you can create a new grape plant just from a tiny, single little bud. Uh, these other ones further down, uh, have we got micropropagation yet? If you've got a laboratory, and there are people who do do this around, uh, you can take almost a single cell of a plant, and if you put it on an agar plate, you can grow it on, and they will form new plants. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do that, go on, pour away. Uh, yeah, sometimes that might be necessary if you want to make sure you've got disease-free stock, like they do it with potatoes sometimes, to make sure there's no diseases on them. Uh, also, if, they want, if they've got a new plant that they've just invented, and they want to make millions of them to flog to the general public. And they did that with a type of petunia about five, seven years ago. And they sold, it was a trailing petunia, so it was perfect for hanging, hanging basket. They could trail and a load of flowers come off them. Uh, Safina uh, petunia it was. And they sold them to millions of people, but they hadn't actually grown them enough. And when they gave them out to people, they didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. So it was almost a complete failure of that. And that would be typical of getting too far ahead of yourself, but yeah, that's not really for us unless we had a, a special old type of plant. So uh, that was growing mixtures and various ways of propagating and working more plants. And along with seed saving, which we're doing in the last session, uh, those core skills uh, are what would give you a lifetime's reward in terms of getting more plants. And also in terms of saving money, uh, yeah, my dad used to, whenever we went out somewhere, <laughs> he'd, he'd, he'd be nibbling bits of plants off and sticking them under his jacket and take them home. But then he, he struck cuttings and he had a whole new plant for free. So I shouldn't encourage that too much, but uh, yeah, that would stand you in good stead long term. So yeah, stock for tea. Um, we've got fresh mint tea today, the salads and oat cakes as ever. And then second half. Oh, in five minutes, <laughs> I'll start giving out herbs.